And I just want to in- interject because this may be the only valuable thing I contribute uh, <laughs> to this book review. Just so when I, when I have the opportunity, I want to say it. But I just want to, I just want to discuss where the title comes from. I just want to talk about where does this title, uh, The Hour Between the, the Dog and the Wolf, actually come from? And, and I'm, I'm not uh, reading what someone else has said here. These are my thoughts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I believe that, I mean, I was just reading the book, and I, and I believe that it's the transformation traders passed through when under pressure, they became cocky and irrationally ris- risk-seeking when on a winning streak, tentative and risk-averse, and then tentative and risk averse when covering from losses, making the transformation from the dog to the wolf and to the dog. All right, welcome back to the Steady Trade Podcast, everyone. As I mentioned in the introduction, we're continuing the, I guess you could call it the fall and the winter book club here at Steady Trade. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can see outside, it's it's winter here in Michigan, it's freezing rain and snowing right now. It's a perfect time to kindle a little fire and, and cuddle up with a book, especially in the northern climates. I'm not in beautiful Hawaii like Kim. I'm not in beautiful Dubai like Stephen. I'm sitting here in the snow for the next nine months. But that being said, it's a great time to read. And, you know, we get asked a lot. And I love that we get asked a lot this. I mean, maybe, probably for me, top five questions I get is what books do you recommend? You know, what books do you recommend? You know, I'm getting started. Or maybe you're even along on your journey and you're struggling a little bit. You know, I, I was talking with a, with a guy in Stocks to Trade Pro today and, you know, not picking on anybody. Everybody's been there, but he's really struggling with, with taking, he's taking the big losses, you know, and he can't get over that hump. And, you know, that's part of fine tuning and, and part of learning and growing. And, and I think books are the best way to do that because it's the one way to focus and really hone your skills. So, as that being said, we're working through the book club, book club today. The book is Between Dog and Wolf, or The Hour Between Dog and Wolf, How Risk-Taking Transforms Us, Body and Mind by John Coates. So, as always, before we get started, I do want to remind you that, you know, if you're listening on iTunes or on Android, Go to SteadyTrade.com. You know, all the episodes are there. And the cool thing is everything is linked. So if you're driving, you don't have to write down the book titles. I don't want you flying off the road or, or, or wiping out on your bike into a, into a pile of broken glass. Only old school Steady Trade listeners will get that reference back from season one. But, um, but anyway, so if, you, if we talk about these books, these links, it's all on the blog. You can check it out there. And then just so you're prepared, um, next month, you know, if you're listening to this now, if you're going to buy a book, next month is Trading in the Zone by Ooh. Mark Douglas. Steve, Stephen gets his book next, well, next month. So uh, I, might, I might switch that for David Goggins because I've just read it and it's absolutely fantastic. But- well, why don't we do that as a bonus? Because, we, you know, I'm looking at the, at the Steady Trade uh, website right now. Everything's linked here. But I tell you, I would 1,000% support adding Can't Hurt Me by Dave Goggins as a bonus on the end. So like I, I would do a three hour podcast on that one. But uh, but before we get started, firstly, hello, welcome. Welcome everybody. And I just want to interject because this may be the only valuable thing I contribute uh, to this book review. Just so when I when I have the opportunity, I want to say it. But I just wanna I just wanna discuss where the title comes from. I just want to talk about where does this title, uh, the hour between the, the dog and the wolf, actually come from? And and I'm I'm not uh, reading what someone else has said here. These are my thoughts. Um, (laughs) I believe that, I mean, I was just reading the book and I I believe that it's the transformation traders passed through when under pressure, they became cocky and irrationally risk-seeking when on a winning streak, tentative and risk-averse, and then tentative and risk-averse when covering from losses, making the transformation from the dog to the wolf and to the dog. I mean, this is my that's, that's very eloquent for just off the top of your head, Stephen. I, 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 mean, I, I, was just, I was just thinking about it today. 
true. He says it's Jekyll. It's the Jekyll and Hyde moment. So, so Kim, um, before we saying. get before we get fully fully going, I, I would like to yeah, let let's Please. let you I, again. This was your pick. What uh, you know? What it, something I always talk about with trading is, you know, people are like, I, I'm thinking about this stock, and actually been working with you on some of these. The first question I always ask is why. Okay, what's what's the why behind this trade idea? You know, uh, give me give me the give me the give me the reason why I'm going to buy this stock or I'm going to short this stock, etc. So. So what made you pick this book? I, this book, when I read it, I, I just, I definitely had that kind of like, it just explained so much. I, I, honestly, when I read this book, I wasn't even thinking about traders. I was thinking about my own personal journey and, uh, you know, the triggers that I have uh, from my past, from challenges I've endured and why today uh, I might be triggered so much quicker because of that, you know, previous experience. So I, I found the book was helpful for me personally to just try to realize that there's certain physiological tendencies that I'm conditioned to have based on previous losses that now might influence how I interpret a, an encounter. And then, of course, I was imagining, wow, this is going to be so valuable for my clients because they aren't maybe putting together that there's a physiological component happening underneath the surface of their choices. Um, I think what I like too the most about this book is how even though he's a scientist, even though he comes from Wall Street, it's very down to earth reading. Yep. This is not jargon. This is not a bunch of very complicated things to wrap your head around. I feel like anybody, even somebody who's not in finance, could read this book and realize things about themselves and their triggers uh, and, and be able to realize, okay, there's certain things that I can do to mitigate them. I mean, I understood parts of it, so for sure. I think, I think it's a book for everyone. <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I really loved the the conversational style too. It's now, now, how did you find it, Kim? I mean, it's a you know, it's a six year old book. Um, how did how did you happen to come across it? I think it's sixteen years old, actually. Oh, is it? Oh, really? Okay, okay. I might have looked wrong. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure it came out in 2003. I want to say I'm double checking here. My uh, book. Oh no, it says 2012. Okay, we're right. I, I, I feel like this book has been in my life for so, like, honestly, <laughs> so long. Um, I think I found it by kind of accident. I, I used okay. to work for stores. I used to work for Borders and Barnes and Noble. Uh, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a book lover. So I, I was fascinated by the title, uh, the, the opening uh, uh, of the book. You know, Stephen, you said something about quotes, and I'm like, I don't really have any quotes, but now I'm going to read a quote <laughs> um, because it's such a good idea. But at the beginning, he has this really cool quote. Or, uh, that's a quote from uh, the book that gave him the title. And it said, you know, about dusk and when you can't distinguish between a dog and a wolf, you know, yeah. that there's an hour uh, when people have hope, half fear, the dog will become a wolf. And I, I think that's really what pulled me in. When I read that opening quote uh, the, in, into the intro of the book, I, I'm interested in folklore, mythology. I'm interested in stories. And it really was the title that sucked me in. And then I saw the subtitle, Risk Taking, Gut Feelings, and the Biology of Boom and Bust. And because of me being a coach, I, I'm you know, aware over the last, especially five or six years, how much the biology uh, does impact uh, our trading and, and our well-being and understanding it opens up our ability to kind of, you know, not maybe control it, but at least control the environment when it shows up uh, and put in kind of stops or things in place, kind of like boundaries to realize, okay, we're going to have this tendency. How do we how do we make sure there's like bumper cars around us for that tendency? It's it's a, um, a m many of the listeners know you know I, I I do a fair fair amount of hunting, and the, you know the description of the hour between dog and wolf reminds me of you know you know this 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 you know this is this confusing moment, and uh, here's here's your dumb hunting analogy of the day, but just like when you're you know you, you go out before dawn because you got to get out there to be ready for the deer, and there's always this point where like every stick 
is a deer. You know, it's like, you know, if you've never sat in a tree stand, you might not know it, but you're like, you're like squinting and you're like, man, that is. And so, so I, I kind of thought of that as I was reading it, just kind of a dumb analogy where, and you gotta, you gotta wait for the sun to come up, you know, you can't, you can't shoot before you know what you got, but it always just, it, it reminded me of that where it's like, every time you, every time you hear a squirrel running, you think it's a deer, so. <laughs> I mean, that's trading, right? Yep. You've got to squint. You've got to look. Is this the one? Is this the one? You've got to wait till dawn. Wait till you have more light on the topic. I mean, you know, I mean, that sounds, you could have been describing trading. <laughs> tell me. But, I, but I mean, from, from what I read, from what I gather, the premise of the book is about the fact that when you're trading, it puts it in the, your body releases hormones that makes you make decisions that might not necessarily be accurate. It puts you in, in inaccurate states that are almost drug-like. Um, and what I, what I wanted to get from you, Kim, is like how obviously trading is like, a, it's a very, it puts you in a, in a very adrenaline hormonal state, hormonal fused state, like it almost like steroids, steroids are released. So how do you learn and what, tip, what did you take from the book that makes you better at coping with these situations? Realizing that you are, you know, a physiological being, that you're not just your intellect, you're not just your uh, desire for discipline, that, that you can't necessarily stop the, you know, the waterfall of things that are going to happen inside of you, and that you put, I think the, the, the thought is, oh, once I know it, then I can control it. Right. <laughs> And I believe that is the misinformation. Yep. You can't control it. Not because we're not disciplined, but because our body has been designed in such a way to help us survive. And these things that happen in trading are very similar to what happened when we were running on the Serengeti away from a lion. So if this is so hardwired into us, then how do we put, uh, create stops, that protect us from ourselves, protect us from that physiology. And that's part of why I think those trading plans are so important because you can't rely on your own wisdom or I in that moment. You're like, yeah, you know what? I am a real physiological being. I need to have these things in place to protect me from myself and this biology. Yeah, and that's that's why I, you know, obviously, long time listeners will will be be like, oh, here we go again. But you know, that's why I just preach and preach and preach, writing down that plan, because it's it to me that that, for lack of a better term, it, it manifests it in reality. You know, it's so much easier to say, well, I'll stop out if it's down a hundred, or I'll stop out if it drops below this support level. But then you can always justify, you know, you can always say, well, but there was this piece of news. Well, it's still early in the day, maybe it will bounce. But I think that that's one of the biggest things by writing it down. And I know I'm kind of old school, but it's like, you, you, you make it a, that, that pen on the paper makes it a reality and, and maybe it won't work for you, but that was one of the things that, that I started doing early on and it just made it so much easier for me to stick to that stop because when you're new, I mean, you feel all the emotions and, and it's because of hormones and because of f f uh, fight or flight, all these things that are going on. But if you've got that index card or that post-it staring you in the face, I think it's a great way to at least maybe be better. I'm not saying it's going to solve everything, yeah. but maybe it'll be better at getting you to stick to it. So There's one part where he talks about, and, and you know, I, I read this book a while ago, so I, I was rereading it and I stumbled into this one part, you know, because I guess I want to just say, it's not just talking about the negative side of physiology, but it's also talking about the positive side of physiology. And the positive side is that there are these, you know, the really great traders and even the traders that he features in the book are traders who have their, they, they are like an athlete around their gut feelings. And there's, there, there is a quote where he talks about gut feelings and emotions, rationality, self-awareness, self-consciousness should be seen more as an advanced tool that emerged over the course of evolution to help us regulate our body. And that these are all kind of indicators. And I really do believe that the traders that are 
in tune to their physiology uh, are the ones who are more successful because you are you have a whole bunch of unconscious triggers that are you are having come before you're conscious of them even when you're looking at your screen and if you begin to be in tune to those hunches and track them then you can get even better and and you can begin to you know pay attention quicker to this feeling you know there's a scene in the in the trading room in the book where everything is kind of relaxed everybody's kind of chill and then all of a sudden there's just like a shift in the energy and the and the really good traders feel that shift and they're and they're not even sure what it is and it's something that's about to happen but they their intuition picks up on it their gut picks up on it and if you can learn that as a trader there's a scene there's a conversation in the book where he talks about those who can count their heartbeats are people who are sometimes more there are people who have good uh, intuition, good in hunches, good connection to their body, and those that are not that good at it, almost like an athlete. And he says, you know, those who can count their heartbeats and it, within a minute are usually people who can rely uh, on their body giving them indicators. There are people who don't have that. So he feels like, wow, can you mention these things were tested for those who have them? Go ahead. One uh, uh, t Tim, I, I just want to put it to you. It's what's so interesting about that is the way the books perspective the way the books put the perspective is that it's almost like you can be so in tune with your physiology that you can make you can rely on your gut but what we've all, what we've often seen and been taught as beginner traders is track the excel track the data take the emotion out take the physiology out and be a robot and make snapshot decisions based on tons and tons of data but what, what I find interesting is the, comp the contrast of approaches. And well, I, and I think, it, great point, but I think, you know, what, what I, and I, and I, see, I see what you're getting at, and, and I think you, you have to do both because I, in my opinion, by tracking that data, you know, tracking the setup stuff we talk about all the time, you're building that scaffolding, okay, or the foundation for, you know, as, as a handyman, you know, you're, that, that, that data tracking, that, that the mechanicals, are your foundation. And then one of the reasons it takes so long to get consistent in this game is you then have to master that emotional side of the things. Because, I mean, we've all been there. I mean, you know, again, Kim's just starting her journey, but you know, you and I have yelled at ourselves. You're like, you're an idiot. Why are you still in this? You know, it's like, yeah. and, and so even though you know, and, and hey, I'm 13 years in and I still make mistakes. I mean, mistakes are part of trading, but you know, it's like, you've got to have that foundation of these, of these building blocks, then you apply it and learn that emotional stuff over time. And, you know, I, I, I joked as we were getting ready about my caveman analysis of things. And, you know, I think about, you know, I think I've learned this over the years, but I wish I would have, you know, read more books like this or maybe met Kim sooner and maybe it would have shortened my learning recognition of this emotion. But, you know, I just tell, because, because people will be like, well, when will I quit, you know, taking big losses? And my, you know, my, my caveman response is when you get fucking sick of taking big losses, you know, at some point you either get sick of it or you quit, you know, and, and that's, what's great about this book is it's telling you, you know, with all this emotion and stuff that's going on, why you're making those mistakes. See, this book, I don't think, is an advocacy of being somebody who's just listening to your intuition. Mm -hmm. you know? And I just want to say that I, I think the concept of what Steady Trade is teaching, what you both are advocating to new traders is they don't have any idea what their hunches are because they haven't been in this game long enough. When you're in this yeah. game, let's say three, five years, your knowledge is going to be triggered then in ways by your hunches. So you can't. Oh no. Are you telling me I got to spend years to learn how to do this? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I'm done. I'm done. No, no. But, but I, I just, I, like one, one important thing just to add to what you're saying, Kim, is that I agree that there's, there's probabilities and setups and, and, and you have a, a, an, an accurate percentage of like how likely you are to win or lose a trade. But you're absolutely right. One of the major hunches that experienced traders have is 
when is my setup about to stop working? When is the market about to change? When, like, when is that big, big runner about to come and is this one going to be it so I should stop shorting? And, and that change in the market, only very veteran experienced traders, very in tune with the physiology, I guess, can understand. Or they've been in the game so long that, you know, they're not even aware that their physiology is informing them. They've been, you know, what is mastery that, that we hear about all the time? Mastery happens after 10 years, after 10,000 hours. So we're, we're talking, this is about mastery, this book. This is not about, hey, I'm going to jump in and just start listening to my hunches. No, it's like realizing and becoming more self-aware that you have you know, even he just talks simply, this, this is just so powerful to me, the green and red on your trading screen, that there is a pre-conscious recognition of red means stop, green means go. And one of his suggestions is change the colors of those on your desk, not just once, but on a regular basis so that you are not I, I, I hear Steven's skeptical fart noises, but I will say this. I have never done that, but I do know several very successful, you know, very successful day traders that have done that. They've gone to like purple and yellow. They've gone to different colors. Myself, I haven't done it, but as, as Steven makes the fart noises, I do know a handful of guys that have done that. So I, I, I just, I just take the props that. off the screen. Just take, take, take the num just take the numbers off the screen. <laughs> I wouldn't mess around with colors. If you're gonna, if you like, if you're worried about the psychological effect of profit and loss, just hide it. Yep. R rather than going, I'm gonna go green or orange or purple or whatever like that. I just, I just think that the point is realizing that there, there are, you know, that we are hardwired to basically do things differently than trading uh, is gonna ask of us. Well, I'm sure there's a reason that a green light is green and a red light is red you know i'm sure they i'm sure you know maybe maybe just some guy picked those numbers but i'm sure there was some rationale behind it you know the colors i mean we're just we're just surrounded by red lights green lights like there there is this kind of entrenched experience around i those. saw red when i opened up the door you know that who's who, what band is that uh, i saw red when i opened up the door I know it's, the Rolling Stones. It's, it's Warrant. It's Warrant. Come on, man. Kim, I thought you knew your 80s metal. Who's Warrant? Oh, we'll move on. We'll move on. Kim's in the 80s metal. Uh, I've, I, I've got a quote that I want to say because it reminds us of me. <laughs> okay, what is it? Um, there's a, the quote that I picked up in the book. It's, um, despite the trader's frequent successes, the story follows the, na the narrative arc of tragedy. With its grim and unstoppable logic of overconfidence and downfall, what the ancient Greeks called hubris and nemesis, for human, for human biology obeys seasons of its own, and as traders make and lose money, they are led almost irresistibly into reoccur reoccurring cycles of euphoria, excessive risks, risk take, taking, and crash. This dangerous pattern repeats itself in the financial markets every year. So don't let me ask you this, I, and I, I know you were kind of saying that tongue in cheek, but I think you you kind of meant it. What 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 made that speak to you specifically? The the, the key lines were the story follows the narrative arc of tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> that was the main thing that spoke to us. No, it, it, it's the fact that we as traders we go through patterns of of euphoria, excessive confidence, and it ultimately leads to our downfall, and it, it becomes our our biggest enemy is we uh, blow up our accounts, and this, well, and you sigh, yeah, you start sizing up, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is why I always, this is why I always trade with an eight hundred dollar account. So then you grow it to four or five thousand dollars, you withdraw it, you start again, you you play from eight hundred, and then if you blow that up, oh, you've only lost six hundred bucks. It's a it's a way to consistently be profitable without much risk, but, and it's a way to combat that excessive confidence. But you never make in real, real, real money. You know and that, that's a that's a, that's a just I'll let you go, Kim. But that's a that's a point that that Stephen, um, you know, if if you're, you know, if you're a listener, you might be listening to these episodes out of sequence. But uh, you know, I I greatly respect Stephen for what he's been doing. Um, he understands back, you know. He understands that the wolf tends to come out and he tends to get a little aggressive. So a step that he's been taking, and I think it's a great idea because you know Stephen's a part-time trader. He's got a he's got a 
a day job. If you're watching, he's at work right now. Um, you know, he's got a day job. He's, he's got a lot of responsibilities. He's got some other side jobs. So he's recognized that one of the best ways for him to trade consistently is just to repeat with a small account. And then if disaster happens, I mean, it can only get so bad when you have a thousand dollar account. I mean, thousand bucks is nothing to sneeze at. Okay. If I see a thousand bucks on the ground, I'm picking it up, but at least, you know, it's, it's manageable and it's not putting him in a financial bad spot. And it's also not putting him in an emotional bad spot because he knows he's not risking a ridiculous amount of money. And something I've been speaking a lot about, um, at, at a lot of these events recently is, you know, I say day trading. I mean, I, I say one of the best ways to do it is just like Steven does treat it like a side hustle. You know, he's got yeah. consistent income at his job. I'm assuming he's got insurance, you know, he's got vacation time and he can just sit there and turn a thousand into 4,000 a month. And Hey, that's, just that, that, that's good nice. money. You know, <laughs> find, 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 it, find a girl and you're living the dream. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I'm even on a date right now as we record the podcast. She's that a, shows she's you. A patient date. She's a patient date. Th that that uh, shows you how yeah. committed Stephen is. Wanna, so. She doesn't want to come on the camera. Oh, you'll, come you'll, on. you'll think I'm making it up like the last time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Kim, this is another, you know, Kim is, you know, is, is, is new to the, oh, it's she's there. Oh, dang it. I was hoping she wouldn't come on. What's your name? What's your first name? What's, what's what? your name? What's your name? Zena. Zena, it's so nice to meet you. You're so beautiful. Thank you. He's such a good guy. Be nice to him. <laughs> okay. Okay. You. Now let's go on to trading. It's not that important. So, so you, you know, a, 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 another old school reference you might not get, get Kim is a few other times Stephen has, has, has been on dates and the date would never come on. So we would always, we would always pick on him about these imaginary friends like touche, touche, old school reference, but <laughs> That's awesome. Touche doesn't exist. <laughs> Is that girl's name Touche? No, it was again. Made a person from France. Yeah, you'll you, you'll you'll have to listen to all the the steady trade episodes, Kim, and then you'll get all of these Easter eggs. So yeah, it's like uh, it's like a uh, Tupac, right? <laughs> I but but two two is not cool. He's a boring loser. Tupac was oh, like a sorry. cool rapper who <laughs> made great songs. Tupac lives in his basement. Oh, poor guy. <laughs> so or, a point. Can I, can I mention one thing? Oh yeah, yeah. Go go ahead. Nope, nope. I just want to say that this this concept he says resilience to stress only comes from experiencing stress. Yep. And yeah, I, I, I love that so much. And the other thing that I read the second time around, what I, which I forgot about, is that he talks about that one of the types of toughening regimes is to exposure to cold water and cold weather. And that regularly exposed to these things, you undergo a toughening kind of regime that allows you to handle you know, prolonged stress. So I'm a big fan of Wim Hof. I don't know if you guys oh, know him. God, I was just about to bring him up. I was and I was going to bring up the point that if, if, if there's ever a steady trade, uh, steady trade cage match, I will win because you two are in Dubai and Hawaii and I'm freezing my ass off nine months a year. But so I take cold showers. <laughs> cold showers. So, so I am constantly being exposed to that, like, and I have to tell you, that was one of the hardest things, but he's, I, I, I love him. I love Wim Hof. I yep. thought, Tim Ferriss, you know, told me about him, I don't know, maybe seven years ago, six years ago. And I was like, no way. There's no way I'm doing the cold shower thing. I was so intimidated by it. I thought I can never handle this. And because I don't like the cold. I mean, I live in Hawaii now for a reason, right? So, <laughs> but when I started, the best part about him is he, you know, as quirky as he is, he's very empathetic to people who are new to cold showers. And, and he just said, you know, start with just the extremities, your arm, your leg, and do it only for like 10 or 20 seconds. And you built up. And now when I don't take the cold rinse after a shower, if I feel like I'm not even awake. So I, I'm just so inspired by that. And when I saw that mentioned in the book, I said, oh my gosh, he's been, he's talking quotes. I read this six years ago and just didn't even see that. So anyway, I'm so- Well, Stephen, you, you mentioned, you, did, 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 have you done any Wim Hof stuff? I've dabbled a little bit. 
So oh, yeah. no, I've yeah. not been jumping in a, in, a, in any icy lakes. But um, I mean, like I've just finished the Dave the David Goggins book, and it's it's exactly the it's all the same stuff repackaged in different ways. <laughs> David Goggins just says you've got to callous the mind. Yep, you've got to do something that sucks every day, and that's just another way of this this author quotes. It's he's just saying you've got to put yourself in stressful situations so you adapt to them. David Goggins is saying you've got to do something that sucks every day. It's like a modern age way of saying the same thing. It's all about callous in the mind, putting yourself in situations so your body adapts to it, and then ultimately adapting, getting on that level, and then going on to the next level. Yeah, that's why I think people, you know, uh, what you've said already about Goggins, Stephen and Tim, about him having such challenges in his, you know, childhood. I, I truly think that when you look at the people who are resilient you know even jocko and you know even the rock like when you look behind the 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 discipline of today you see these stories of people overcoming incredible adversity and i really you know i don't talk about it much but i had a lot of adversity growing up as well and i have no doubt that that adversity it informs my abilities today in so many ways most of all empathy you know, I, I'm able to have empathy for people that, you know, some people could never have empathy for. And I really believe that's because of the journey I've had. But that's why I guess I want to say to people and certainly some young people who send me emails, you know, they're struggling with kind of the way their life looks right now. I'm like, all of that is you getting you trained. Yep. It's, your, it's your basic training. It's going to get you to where you really want to be, whether you're a trader or something else. You know, you got to be able to handle the hard to be with stuff and find a way to surf it internally and externally. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that, uh, you know, I, I think we talk about it, you know, and, and, and Stephen, again, has shared a lot, most of his journey the last couple of years, you know, is, is something that I, I try and tell everybody is, is you're coming to this podcast because you're probably new to trading. If you're new to trading, it's going to be a disaster, okay? It's a disaster. Kim is just starting. It's going to be a disaster, okay? She's going to make every mistake in the world, you know, but, but that's how you get better at it. That's how you learn these things. And I think that's one of the reasons that if you've got that grit or that commitment, I mean, this, this – Trading's accessible to anybody. Okay, no broker is going to turn you down. Okay, you can you can have a you know a criminal record. You could be a terrible person, but every broker will still take your money. You know, and and I think that's what's awesome about it. But you also have to you know I think who says embrace the suck is that Goggins? I think Goggins says embrace. Well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like you just please do that. If if tomorrow or today is your first trade realize that it's, it's going to be a disaster. Okay. Nobody succeeds day one. But I, I just want to go bigger picture and say, you are in the shape of your own destiny and it's not in the hands of anyone else. Like if you're young and you want to get a good looking girlfriend, lose weight. I said this before, lose weight, get a tan, improve your teeth and improve your fashion sense. <laughs> If you yeah, if you, if you want a better girlfriend or boyfriend, make yourself a better girlfriend or boyfriend. You know, that, that you know, it's like, it, 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 it. <laughs> but if you, if you want to be a damn good trader or put 10,000 hours in learning, studying, getting the right education, making every mistake in the book, obviously lose small, be practical. If you want to be a famous guitar player, go move to the capital city and sleep on loads of beds and room share everywhere and play the goddamn guitar every day. Do you know what I mean? Okay. If but you want you to be an average trader, put an average workload in. Totally. So I just, I just want to say part of the reason why I think it's hard for people to be with the hard to be with or to, uh, you know, deal with the fact that you're going to be disaster in the beginning is because we have culturally made people feel like bad or wrong for, you know, if you are shaming yourself for having disasters, it's going to be really hard for you to be with disasters. If you are making yourself wrong and beating yourself up because you make mistakes or because of X, Y, or Z, that, that isn't your ideal way of showing up in the world or in your trades, how can you, how can you deal with that stress? You can't because shame is freaking paralyzing. So that's why, you know, I'm such an advocate for like, if you can be comfortable with your humanity, then you have a, a chance at transforming it. 
But if you make yourself wrong and feel like shit all the time for being human or for your peccadilloes, then how are you going to be able to ever get past them? And, that, and that's the first step of being able to look yourself in the eye and see your shadow, you know, or your mistakes. So, uh, uh, Stephen, I know you saved a few more quotes. Did you, did you have more of those quotes you wanted to throw out? Or? I can throw one out, but just before I do it, I just want to say that people need to change the mindset around failure. Failure yeah. is a great, great thing. Failure mm-hmm. is your best friend because failure is the thing that puts you one step closer to success. You've got to embrace failure and you've got to learn to love it. So making the mistakes in the early day of trading is a, is a great, great thing. Yep. And, and, and it's like, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's very well said. It's just like, I mean, everybody, I mean, not to repeat what I said, but everybody sucks at the beginning, you know, whether it be like Stephen mentioned the guitar. Okay. Nobody picks up the guitar and rips off Van Halen riffs. You know, it's like, it takes you years, you know? Yeah. yeah and, and, and the quote is just, I, I, I took this because I thought it was interesting between like the relationship between brain and body and, and does brain control body or does body control brain or they obviously work together, but I'll read the quote and I'll see what you guys think of it. It says, why does the brain send a signal to the body telling it to produce a chemical, which in turn changes the way the brain works? What a strange thing to do. If the brain wants to change the way it thinks, why not keep all the sign- signaling within the brain? Why take such a roundabout route through the body? And why would a single molecule like a steroid be entrusted with such a broad mandate, simultaneously changing both body and brain? Mm. Leave that to Kim. Oh, Tim, I trust you, Tim. (laughs) I think it's fascinating. And I think, you know, maybe we don't have an answer to that question. But, you know, all I know is that we are at the highest of the food chain right now among all the creatures on this planet. So somewhere that must be serving us or we wouldn't be where we are. Yeah. I think the biggest, and it's funny, I actually, you know, so full disclosure, I always pick on Steven. I did not, sometimes I'm too honest, but I did not finish this month's book. I had a bunch of travel the last few weeks, not making excuses, but I do remember that passage because it was in the first few chapters. And uh, my biggest takeaway, and I will, number one, I will freaking finish this book. It's badass, okay? I, uh, I'm commenting on what I've read so far, and I'll, I'm, I know I'll finish it this weekend. But um, the biggest takeaway I had was part of that passage and was part of the beginning about that mind and body connection. Um, Many of you might be familiar, you know, um, I, I, Tim Sykes and I argue about this all the time about exercise and eating right. And I say it translates to your trading and we'll kind of debate this at times, but the author makes this point too, that, that, you know, you need, especially with trading, you need to burn off that stress. And one of the best ways to do that is with exercise, whether it be running or lifting weights and, you know, again, I'm the ultimate Joe Rogan fanboy. Joe talks about this all the time. You know, one of the reasons Joe is so laid back, well, he smokes a pound of weed a day, but the other reason he's so laid back is he, I mean, he trains every day and he'll say over and over again that when he doesn't work out, he starts getting antsy. He starts getting anxiety. He starts, he feels like he's a different person. And, and the first, the beginning stages of this book is I thought, drove home that mind body connection and and you got if you're a listener you know i talk about this all the time i'm like man you got it, this is this might be the hardest thing you ever do trading especially if you're going to try and do it full time you might be trying to do the hardest thing ever and if you're not taking care of yourself you're just you're making it harder you know you're like you're like tying weights to your or or like putting a heavy load behind a car and you're wondering why you can't go down the road you know you're just creating baggage and uh and it reminded me of of the conversation before we got started because that was going to be my main point from the book about the mind body connection and taking care of yourself and here steven shows up i see on his instagram he's worked out like i think every day for like the last 38 days he shows up he's in a great mood you know, he, he looks great. Tan. He's tan. He's he bragging great. about his, you, you saw his beautiful new girlfriend, his job's going great. And it's like, we, we joked about it, but I'm like, man, it's amazing when you just get yeah. up and you do that 
shitty thing every day. Man. Nobody wants to run for an hour every day, but you do it and you do it every day. And all of a sudden things just start clicking. So like, I'll just add to that. Cause you, 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 well, the prerequisite to it, but like, like I was doing well at trading and I was making money at trading, but like, I, I, even though I was making money at trading, I never felt fulfilled or, or truly happy. And, and then you get to a point where like the pain of staying the same is worse than the pain of changing. And that's when I just thought like, mind the curse, fuck this. I'm going to do something big. And the Dave Gargan's book helped motivate us, but 38 days is not a lot of time. Like 38 days, about 45 now, 40 days of making a commitment every single day. And then, Sitting happy, jobs going well, trading's going relatively well, well across the year. And then uh, you get some more confidence. You pick up a good-looking girl. She fulfills you in ways that that you never thought you could feel happy about. And uh, and then your life is flipped upside down. So if anyone's out there feeling down, get running. Get on the bike until you're fit enough to get running. But please exercise. Although Tim was not full of shit, but exaggerating the benefits of exercise and i thought your rogan was exaggerating them and then i experienced it for myself and i was like i'm never ever ever stopping this beautiful love it love it awesome congrats steven so did you guys have any kind of summary any any other points you guys want to make or do we do we take this thing home take your home Okay, so um, again, thank you everyone. Welcome back, Stephen. Yeah. Stephen's been busy, so it's been a few weeks since we've had him on. Want to welcome Kim. Again, Kim is a full-time co-host on Steady Trade now. Um, we've got a bunch of amazing stuff for 2020. We've, we've got a bunch of big plans. We're really excited. And uh, so, so definitely keep listening. And as always, I would like to remind you at the end, um, any of these links, anything we talked about, um, we have the team take notes as we as we do the podcast. So all these books we mention, all these uh, you know podcasts, everything we mention is on SteadyTrade.com. So so if you're listening, you know again on your on your phone, head over there. All the links are there. And lastly, the book of this month was The Hour Between Dog and Wolf, How Risk-Taking Transforms Us, Body and Mind by John Coates. And your next job is to get Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. Um, I read this about, well, relatively recently. I read Trading in the Zone probably about nine months ago and really liked it. So that is the book for December, January-ish. And as always, would like to thank you for listening to Steady Trade Podcast, and we'll see you next time.